So I've really heard it about my uh, latest video about the AR-15 and the lies that are going around it. Specifically, I was talking about how this idea is, oh, the AR-15 is this military weapon and it's big and powerful and bad and awful and that's why we should ban it and all that and how it's really low powered and just the really dumb arguments coming from it, like, well, it was used by the military. It was used by the military. It was used by the military. That makes it a military rifle. Well, I mean, you could say that about, you know, the Beretta 92FS, a 9mm handgun, fairly typical one, issued by the military. That's a military weapon. That's a military weapon. It means nothing. It's like military-grade encryption. It doesn't mean anything, really. Um, so... The, the other thing is that uh, a lot of people were saying, well, AR-15s are actually pretty good for home defense, but that's an entirely different context. I was talking about the military context when you're firing someone, you know, 100 yards away, as opposed to like a home invasion when they're 10 feet away. That's a different thing entirely. But anyway, responding to all these critics and going on, this is a, a fairly recent one in uh, the Volok Conspiracy. Well, it's actually just going over a lot of these, and this is a really long article, so I'm going to have to divide this down into two videos. But I thought I'd check this out, because it, it really, it is just so crazy. Just people claiming that there's this awesome destructive power of the AR-15, AR and it just needs to die to death once and for all. So, let's get into this. We'll, we'll go to about halfway down, and then uh, do the rest in another video, so... This is David Capel on Reason.com. And he says, Assault weapons long have been portrayed as exceptionally powerful firearms that are far more dangerous than other modern firearms and ill-suited for lawful activities like self-defense. When enacting the nation's first assault weapon ban in 1989, the California legislature declared that each firearm has such a high rate of fire and capacity for firepower that its function as a legitimate sports or recreational firearm is substantially outweighed by the danger that it can be used to kill and injure human beings. Couldn't you say that about any gun? Couldn't you say that about a Derringer? I mean, come on. First, second, and fourth circuits asserted that assault weapons have a capability for lethality, more wounds, more serious, and more victims, far beyond that of other firearms in general, including other semi-automatic guns. The DC Circuit claimed that assault weapons like AR rifles, designed to shoot multiple human targets very rapidly and fire almost as rapidly as automatics. They don't know what rapidly means. Rapidly means you hold down the trigger and it keeps firing. Whereas semi-automatic or non-rapid fire is just you pull the trigger once you get one bullet. And their spray fire design makes them more dangerous in mass shootings. I have no idea what spray fire is supposed to mean. The closest thing I can think of is like a shotgun where it has the shots that, that go out, but that's, an AR-15 doesn't do that. The Fourth Circuit went so far as to hold that assault weapons are not protected arms under the Second Amendment because of their deadly similarity to machine guns. Now remember, the whole excuse behind restricting firearms in the 1936-whatever uh, big firearms case was, was because you could restrict firearms that were not military capable. And since a shot, sawed-off shotgun is not capable of being used by any military, it's not a military weapon, therefore, you can ban it. Okay, well, that wasn't true then, it isn't true now, but that's the principle. Since the whole point of the Second Amendment is to arm people for the militia, because the militia is the armed body of the people, then they need military weapons. And now, as I've pointed out before, they're going the other way. They're saying, since it is a military weapon then it's not suitable for civilians and it has to be banned, so. The First Circuit cited medical sources claiming that assault weapons cause far more devastating wounds than other firearms 
and called it using a sledgehammer to crack open the shell of a peanut. Yeah, so um, it starts off with like the rate of fire claim, which is dumb. I mean, how how fast can you pull your, your finger back? You know, that that's your rate of fire. Rate of fire has no meaning in a semi-automatic weapons or even just regular weapons that you have to, you know, cock between each round. But I mean, it'll be the same rate, it just like just like a handgun, you know, the 92 FS that I mentioned or a Glock or whatever, you know, how fast can you, you know, squeeze them off? And the second is that assault weapons bullets are so much more destructive than bullets for other firearms. So after Bruin, more absurd claims are appearing in court filings and opinions about the extreme firepower of assault weapons and their unsuitability for defense. And uh, he goes into a case we've talked about, Rub v. Bonta, uh, which ca uh, challenges California's assault weapons ban. You're remanded by the Ninth Circuit for reconsideration in light of Bruin, currently pending in federal district court. And... Bevis v. City of Naperville, Illinois, denying a preliminary injunction against state and local assault weapon bans. I'm not going over the number one because it's just the names. We've talked about that. AR is Armalite, not Assault Rifle, etc. And then Colt bought it and then Colt patents the AR-15 and it's only an AR-15 and it's made by Colt, so... Let's go down to number two, and I think we'll... Number two goes on for a long time. So we're not going to quite get through number two by the time we're done with the video, and then there's a number three after that, but... This is about Colonel Craig Tucker of the U.S. Marine Corps, infantry officer for 25 years, commanded combat units in Iraq. And so... He, he was the one who was describing this lethality of the AR-15. And his report says the AR-15 and M4 are both designed to fire a 223 round that tumbles upon hitting flesh and rips through the human body. A single round is capable of severing the upper body from the lower body or decapitation. The round is designed to kill, not wound, and both the AR-15 and M4 contain barrel rifling. This is a new one on me. Barrel rifling to make the round tumble upon impact. What? What? And cause more severe injury. I mean, we're going to go over this, but you, most of you are already seeing how dumb this is. The combination of automatic rifle and 223 round is a very efficient killing system. The same can be said of the AR-15, even though it isn't automatic. Oh my god. Well, we just went over the round, the 223 or the 556. So I'm gonna skip down lower. Yeah, let's get to the tumbling thing. Cause the tumbling thing is dumb, isn't it? It's just dumb, and he relies heavily on Dr. Martin Fackler, military trauma surgeon, former director of the Army's Wound Ballistics Laboratory, so he would know, the most widely recognized modern expert on the subject said, probably no scientific field contains more information than wound ballistics. And certainly not when it comes to the AR-15. Other things being equal, a bullet fired from a longer barrel will have a higher velocity than a bullet fired from a shorter barrel. We talked about that because that's it can only accelerate as it's going down the barrel. Once it comes out the other end and hits the open air, the gases aren't going to push the bullet forward. They're just going to expand out in the air. So, so like in a handgun, it only travels, what, a few inches. Whereas in a, um, in a rifle, it'll travel, you know, a foot and a half or whatever, maybe even longer. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just spending a longer time being accelerated. Bullets from AR rifles typically have about three times the muzzle velocity of common handgun bullets. Muzzle velocity is measured at the moment the barrel exits the bullet. As the bullet travels downrange, velocity declines due to air friction. More velocity 
does not necessarily mean greater wound severity. Something to keep in mind. Sorry, I was just checking my levels there. This might sound better. I might have to juice it up in post, but... Yeah, I think those levels are going to be better. All right, so more velocity does not mean more wound severity. It talks about kinetic energy. We all remember this. Ke equals one half mv squared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, the bullets for the most common AR calibers, two two three and five five six, are much smaller than the bullets from any other rifles. Thus, they strike with only about a half to a third of the kinetic energy of larger caliber rifle bullets such as 270, 30 out 6, 308, 338, 444, and so on. The larger bullets not only have a greater width, i.e. caliber, the diameter, but they're also typically longer. Skipping some technical stuff, tissue damage from bullets comes primarily from the permanent crushing of tissue in the bullet's path. That's the permanent cavity, the hole that it leaves. If the bullet is traveling fast enough, the pressure wave following the bullet can cause a temporary stretching of tissue around the bullet's path. That's the temporary cavity, aka temporary track. The size of the permanent cavity is proportional to the size of the bullet. The size of the temporary cavity can vary greatly depending on the size and location of the temporary cavity on the bullet's path and the elasticity of the tissue affected. Are you hitting, you know, muscle, bone, adipose tissue, whatever? Hey, the bullets fired from an AR do not tumble upon hitting flesh. Bullets do not tumble. Um, so, and, and this goes to the rifling thing too. We'll get to the rifling, but the basic idea is it's called a rifle because it has rifling and Pretty much all modern handguns do this, too. You know the James Bond thing where, you know, you have the, the gun sight on him and he shoots at him and for some reason it bleeds inside the gun, but you have those spirals going all around it. That spiral is the rifling and it twists the bullet as it comes out. So if you think of a football player throwing a long pass, as he throws it, he's going to give the ball a spin. And so it keeps its trajectory, it keeps that nice, beautiful arc, as opposed to like a kickoff where the football's tumbling over and over. And, and it's less predictable than that. So there is a change in bullet angle called yaw, but that's not tumbling. Tumbling is like end over end. AR users choose ammunition that is designed not to yaw, but instead to deform. And he's talking about things like hollow points. And he spends time going over that via FMJ. I don't think we need to go over that, but we've talked about these before. The hollow points can actually mushroom out as they go into the target. And by doing so, they increase the, uh, the area of the, uh, the frontal movement so that there's more pressure stopping them so that they don't over-penetrate and uh, go through and hit something else. Colonel Tucker's declaration provides no indication that he has any familiarity with the above, namely that civilian AR users can and often do choose AR ammunition that is specifically designed not to tumble. Instead, Colonel Tucker seems to mistakenly believe that all civilian users of AR rifles use the same ammunition as does the military for the M16 and M4. That's the 556 FMJ. The lead core is surrounded by the copper jacket, lead's a soft material. And he talks about it being 1.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. A little bit of a typo there. A lot of people make this mistake. There's no apostrophe there. Mohs is the guy's name. He's not Mo, and it's his hardness scale. He's Mo's, and Mo's is also the name of the hardness scale he devised. So, anyway, nitpick, but you know. And he also talks about lead fouling and, and how it can degrade accuracy. Uh, that that's the reason for the copper jacket. You're preventing 
Valiant. It's not any kind of like armor piercing or great, you know, big everything. No, it's just to prevent fouling. So, yeah, we've covered a lot of this before, so I'm going to skip down a little more. According to the California Attorney General and Colonel Tucker, the 223 round begins to instantly tumble upon hitting flesh. As explained above, they're designed not to tumble. Dr. Fackler found that about 85% of military 5.56 FMJ bullets travel point forward at least 5 inches before beginning to yaw. The straighter the bullet hits the target, the longer it will take to yaw after it strikes. Thus, a non-deforming full metal jacket rifle bullet can pass completely through a human target without yawing or fragmenting, leaving a small wound channel and relatively mild injury. Relatively mild injury unless it strikes a vital organ, bone, or other critical structure. Wow, I thought they were made to just make human beings explode into smithereens. And he goes into a lot of the controversy about it. We covered that in the other video. About how they were trying to say, oh, we can save up, uh, have a lower weight so we, they're not as heavy to carry around, but the less the stopping power. There have been numerous reports that the military's 5.56 FMJ has insufficient terminal effectiveness in combat. Combat veteran and military small arms expert Jim Schatz explains the disturbing failure of the 556 to consistently offer adequate incapacitation has been known for nearly 20 years. He describes one special forces mission in Afghanistan when an insurgent was shot seven or eight times in the torso with a 556, got back up, climbed over a wall, and re-engaged other SF soldiers, killing a SF medic. The insurgent was then shot another six to eight times from about 20 to 30 yards before finally being killed by a SF soldier with a handgun. And it's like Rasputin or something there. Bob Mailer, former Australian SAS sniper, has on several occasions witnessed bad guys being hit multiple times by 556 at varying ranges and then continuing to fight. While the 556 round is designed to yaw and fragment, this isn't happening all the time, and projectiles are passing through the body with minimal damage. Even with ones that are designed to yaw and fragment, it's not happening. That's consistent with Dr. Fackler's own findings. In 1980, I treated a soldier shot accidentally with an M16 M193 bullet from a distance of about 10 feet. The bullet entered his left thigh and traveled obliquely upward. It exited after passing through about 11 inches of muscle. The man walked into my clinic with no limp whatsoever. The entrance and exit holes were about 4 millimeters across and punctuate. X-ray film showed intact bones no bullet fragments, and no evidence of significant tissue disruption caused by the bullet's temporary cavity. The bullet path passed well lateral to the femoral vessels. He was back on duty in a few days. Devastating? Hardly. In my experience and research, at least as many M16 users in Vietnam concluded that the 556 produced unacceptably minimal rather than massive wounds. And he reiterates what I have been saying for oh so long. The 223 Remington is a varmin cartridge used effectively for shooting woodchucks, crows, and coyotes. And he's also talking about what I mentioned in the last video, and we've talked about it several times before, about how it's too low caliber for hunting deer. You know, so when Biden goes, oh, deer and Kevlar vests. No, no. Even without the Kevlar vest, it's, it's too small. Hey, I've been going on to this for 20 minutes. I know I haven't said a whole lot new, but this is all prologue 
for the rest of it. We're about halfway down. Yes, this is a long article. I know I've been doing a lot of skipping. I'm going to do less skipping in the next one, but for right now, I'm going to call it uh, the video and just wrap this up and we'll get into the next one next time with 2C. We're going to talk about all sorts of issues about uh, decapitation, all sorts of other things. Um, let's see, it was... We got the decapitation, uh, designed to kill, not wound. Uh, barrel rifling, we'll cover more about that. Uh, rate of fire, terminal effects, muzzle velocity, wound damage, and also the differences between the uh, wound path of the AR-15 versus a low velocity handgun. So that's going to be interesting. Make sure you stay tuned for that. Until then, comments for the coming God, shares for the share throne. Please hit like, subscribe, and the bell. And I'll always go to donate.bogosity.tv. Keep me doing what I do. Check this stuff out on Patreon and subscribe. Star everyone there gets it early and ad free and can, can really help a lot of you saw my rant about how I haven't seen a penny from my most popular video because they decided to make a copyright claim about it and it's been held in escrow for literally years with no one getting it you know, of the over $1,000 that it's it's made in it. So I don't know if that'll ever be resolved or if I'll ever see a penny of that. So if you want to make sure, then please go. Don't you know, don't rely on ads to, uh, to uh, support your um, favorite uh, content creators. Go to Patreon, subscribe star, please donate. Uh, and all sorts of other things too. I've got, I've got to do the live stream this month. I know it's graduation time. Our youngest isn't graduate, but she's being promoted from middle school to high school. And that's happening in a couple of days. So it's kind of hectic about that. So we'll get it done. Uh, there's monthly AMAs and everything else. Please go check that out. Thank you so very much until next time. Stay strong and be free.